Today there is an eat and ask after the service. Everyone's invited to come and eat. We do have uh, sliced brisket and brisket sandwiches. We have uh, chicken and sausage. So please feel free to come. Today we're looking in Proverbs. I'm going to look at marriage. This Proverbs talks about it. Um, some of these verses may seem like they're pull, pulled out of context, but I hope I can show that they apply. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we look into his word. Father, how thankful we are that you've given us your truth, that you have accomplished great and mighty things through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. For our salvation, we give you abundant thanks for the resurrection and the hope that we have in him, we give you abundant thanks. For the down payment of the spirit that we would one day be completely redeemed from even these pitiful bodies, we give you great thanks. For your amazing love and your amazing grace, we give you thanks. You are a God who has done all things well. Pray that our hearts would be prepared to hear your truth and that your spirit would be our teacher. As we look into these words, that you have had mighty men of God pen for our instruction. We give thanks to you in Christ's name. Amen. Marriage. Marriage is a, a difficult term these days. Um, I I've had arguments with people over what it is, what it isn't. I've had um, people say that it's like they're married, but they're not really married. Uh, there's divorce everywhere. And yet the Bible doesn't seem to indicate that any of these things are true. Think about the two people who are living together. They say, well, we love each other and we um, are committed to each other. Well, that's fine and dandy, but uh, somebody wants to find a marriage. I don't even know if I hold to what this guy says much. I don't even remember who it was. But he said that marriage was one, a relationship an enjoyable relationship that you have with another individual. But they also said that a marriage is a covenant contract. You agree on certain things and that's that. So if you think about all the marriages in the Bible, did they have those two aspects? Did they have some covenant contract and some relationship of love? It seems like that's the way it is. With most marriages, and unless you look at Solomon, who had seven, 300 wives and 700 concubines, I don't know they could have had a relationship with all of them. But um, but I wonder whether these people have stopped to think what the Bible says or even care what the Bible says. So I'm going to take a look at what the Bible says as far as what kind of wives we have, and I've got husbands under here too, so let's take a look at what a good wife is, first of all. In Proverbs chapter 12, in verse 4, it says, An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Wives out there, are you the crown of your husband? Are you what shows him off and makes him look good? That's what you're supposed to be. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Then we have a bad wife in the second half of the verse. But she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. Or are you a wife that shames your husband and you put him down and you um, irritate him and you vex him and you have contentions with him? 
you're like rottenness in the bones. I mean, think about that. Rottenness in the bones? That's as deep as it gets. That's as bad as it gets. That's just terrible. Proverbs 18, verse 22 Talks about a good wife. It says, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Men, have you found a wife? Have you found a good thing? Then you have obtained favor or grace from God. I, I, I think about what our young people are subject to these days and I don't know if there are very many women, and I'm sorry to say this, I'm not too, I'm not too sure too many women are a woman who would be a good thing that you would obtain favor from the Lord if you married them. I mean, there's still some out there. I know, I know there's some. Solomon said, if you find a wife, you find a good thing, and you obtain grace or favor from the Lord. Yeah, I remember I stood up and read this passage when I got engaged to my wife in church. And I said, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. And then I said, I've obtained favor from the Lord and found a good thing. I'm getting married. <laughs> so... Um, She's been a wonderful wife. Of course, I don't need to say that. You all know that she is. She married me, right? <laughs> okay. Proverbs 19, verse 14. Let's go to verse 13 because it has something about a bad wife there. It says, a foolish son is a destruction to his father. How many of you? No, no, no hands. How many of you all have a foolish son? Man, that just feels like they're destroying you. They're working against you all the time. You're trying to get them on the right way. They won't go the foolish way. And it's like destruction. It's like they just take it out of you. But he also says in verse 13, And the contentions of a wife are a constant dripping. Nag, 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 nag. Talk, talk. Talk, talk, talk. Let's get something done. No, no, no. We need to talk about it. Um, the contentions of a wife are a constant dripping. Now, some of y'all would do well to listen to your wife. I know I would. But you know what the torture is that they give people that are captives and they try to get them to release information. You know what kind of torture they give them? Drip, 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 drip. I went on like this for another 45 minutes. You guys would be out of your minds, wouldn't you? That's what the contentions of a foolish wife are like. They're like a constant dripping. No one enjoys it. In Proverbs 19, verse 14, it says, House and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. If you have a prudent wife, or if you want to be a wife that's uh, from the Lord, you need to be prudent. You need to be wise. You need to know what this book says and that you need to follow it so that you would be a prudent wife. Again, it says, a prudent wife is from the Lord. If you have a wife who is wise and gives you wise counsel and tells you wise things, you can be thankful to the Lord that you have such a wife because a prudent wife is from the Lord. If we go to Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 9, 
It says, it is better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house shared with a contentious woman. Now, you got to remember the houses back then weren't that like the houses today. And slant down, you live in a little corner. No, they were flat. They could be lived in. They could be lived on. But it'd be better to live in just a little corner of that room there than with a contentious woman. Because a contentious woman is torture. Drip, 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 drip. If you have a prudent wife, you have one that's from the Lord, you can be very, very thankful. Proverbs 21, 19 says something very similar. It says, it is better to live in a desert land than with a contentious and a vexing woman. Jeremiah asked the Lord, please send me out into the desert and let me live all by myself out there. I'd rather live out there than with these people you've given me. But when he said that, his heart burned inside of him. He had to go tell the people the message that God had for them. But personally, Jeremiah had had it with the nation of Judah. And he just wanted to go get a, a lodging in the desert. There's nothing in the desert. It's a lonely place. But Jeremiah wanted to go to the desert, get a hotel there, and just stay there the rest of his life because the people of Judah were so difficult. Well, it says here that it's better to live in the desert than with a contentious and vexing woman. 25, verse 24. It's better to live in the corner of a roof than, with, than in a house shared with a contentious woman. This is basically saying one of those things that this is better than that. Uh, it's better to eat vegetables where love is than a fatted calf where hatred is. Uh, it's not so much what you eat as it is who's there celebrating with you. Are they in agreement with you? Do they love you? Do you love them? Is there harmony? That's what he's saying here. Uh, it's better living in the corner of a roof than a house shared with a contentious woman. You can share your house with a contentious woman. But um, it would be better to live in the corner of a roof. Proverbs 25, 24, Proverbs 27, 15, and 16. Is a constant dripping on a day of steady rain. You know, you live in one of those mud huts and it's dripping, drip, 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 in a bucket. And a contentious woman are alike. Those constant drippings are just like a contentious woman. He who would strain her restrains the wind and grasp oil with his right hand. Have you ever tried to grab the wind and stop it? Stop the wind? That's a vain thing indeed. Have you ever tried to grasp oil in your right hand? It slips right out. Now, I've got a bad left knee, a pulled left hand string. I got Parkinson's in the right hand of my body. When I drop something, <laughs> it takes me a while to pick it up. I can't pick it up quickly. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. But I can pick it up eventually. But if you start putting oil on it, <laughs> it's not going to be picked up at all. Um, he would restrain her, restrains the wind, grasp oil in his right hand. If you can grasp oil in your right hand and hold it there without it squirting everywhere, then you can contain this contentious woman. If you can restrain the wind, you can contain this contentious woman. But no one can do that. 
in Proverbs 31 and verse 10. An excellent wife, who can find? For her worth is far above jewels. Yeah. Her worth is far above jewels. An excellent wife. I think most of y'all have excellent wives if you're married out there. I know I have an excellent wife. I know her worth is far above jewels. Her worth is priceless. There's nothing I could do without her. Um, an excellent wife. So we looked at what a good wife is and what a bad wife is. Well, now let's take a look at the husbands. Who are the good husbands? Who are the bad husbands? Okay, Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16 says this. We got a good and a bad husband here. Proverbs 12, 16 says, A fool's anger is known at once, but a prudent man conceals dishonor. What does it say a foolish man does? He lets what bothers him be known immediately. And he gets angry about it. But a wise man conceals honor. So what kind of husband are you? Are you a husband that just flies off the handle at the slightest infraction of someone? Or are you a prudent man who can um, conceal your dishonor? Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 17. This is a quick-tempered man acts foolishly, and a man of evil devices is hated. Notice it links a man of evil devices with a quick-tempered man, because those who are quick-tempered do evil things very quickly. Again, are you quick-tempered? Do you have an anger issue? Every time something happens, you have to lose your cool. Or Proverbs chapter 14, verse 29 he who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is quick-tempered exalts folly. And why is this the case? Why is someone who um, slow to anger, why do they have great understanding? Because God is slow to anger. They understand who God is, and they understand what God requires of people, that they be like him. So, he who is slow to anger has great understanding. He has great understanding. He understands who God is, and he understands who he is made in the image of God. Proverbs 15, verse 1. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I can't tell you how many times, and I do have an anger issue, I'm sorry. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I have just been as upset as I can be at work. And somebody will give me a gentle answer and it'll turn away my wrath. For I'll recognize what a fool I am for being angry over something that's so silly. But a harsh word stirs up anger. If somebody wants to fight me, I'm going to fight them. You need to hear those gentle answers that turn away wrath. Then in Proverbs 15, verse 18, it says, A hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms the dispute. What kind of person are you? Are you one that stirs up the anger? Or are you one that... Um, uh, Calms the dispute. See, when Jesus was being led away to be crucified, what were the people doing? 
They were furious with him, weren't they? Did they even know why they were angry at him? Most of them probably didn't even know why they were angry at him. They had said to Hosanna in the highest a week earlier. Now they're saying, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Uh, we wouldn't ask for somebody to be crucified if he hadn't done something wrong. He's done something wrong. We know that. No gentle answers turning away that wrath. Then Paul goes to Ephesus. And somebody starts to chant, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the... And everybody starts getting riled up. Where a riot almost took place. But it says in... Proverbs 15, verse 18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife. Those Pharisees were quite hot-tempered, but the slow to anger calms the dispute. There is no one who is slow to anger except Christ, and he didn't open his mouth to say anything. Proverbs 18. No, no, no. Uh, Proverbs 16. Verse 32, he who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules the spirit than he who captures the city. Who are the greatest generals of all time? Joshua, Robert E. Lee, Patton. These men went into battle, and they won big battles, right? No, you who are slow to anger and who can rule your spirit are better than all of them. He who can capture a city, anybody can go capture a city if they just have enough people. But he who rules his spirit is stronger than that. Think about that. Taking a city versus ruling your spirit. He who rules the spirit is Stronger than he who captures a city. Proverbs 22, verse 1. I think we're going to skip Proverbs 22, verse 1, because I don't know how it applies. Uh, Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Oh, I'm, I'm on the wrong thing. That's one. Proverbs 19, 11, and 19, 13. Man's discretion makes him slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression. Do you overlook transgressions? You say, no biggie. I'm not going to hold that again. That was, that, was, that was nothing. That was worthless. Yeah, I was offended, but it's not that big a deal. Or do you hold grudges? Want to get back at people? In 1913, a foolish son is, uh, we've already done that one. Okay. Proverbs 27, verse 3. I like this one. Stone is heavy and sand is weighty. You ever picked up one of those little bags of concrete at the uh, Lowe's place? Just a little bag of sand, a little bag of concrete. Oh, wow. That little bag weighs a whole lot. It's very weighty. And it says in Proverbs 27.3, a stone is heavy. And sand is weighty, but the provocation of a fool is heavier than both of them. And we just get weighed down with the foolishness of fools. That's why I can't watch TV, the news, very much. I don't care what channel it's on. Just a bunch of fools saying foolish things. I just get tired of it.
Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. Nope, nope, nope. Proverbs 29, verse 22. An angry man stirs up strife, and a hot-tempered man abounds in transgression. You want to abound in transgression? Be hot-tempered. Be angry. Be full of wrath and rage. I tell you what, you make a fool of yourself, and you make a destruction of everything around you. What about diligence? Proverbs chapter 10, and verse 4, says, poor, he, poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Make sure you're looking, if you're a young woman, for a man who's diligent, who's willing to work, work hard, and earn an honest living. Proverbs 12 Verse 27 says, A lazy man does not roast his prey, but the precious possession of a man is diligence. Now, why will a lazy man not roast his prey? Or why is that even important? Because if you didn't roast your prey, it's going to be eaten with the blood, and it's going to be uh, meat that's not what God wants you to eat, but he's so lazy, he won't even get up and roast his prey. He won't even roast the food that he's been given. He's that lazy. But the precious possession of a wise man is his diligence. Proverbs 13, verse 10 says, Through insolence comes nothing but strife, but wisdom with those who receive counsel. Don't know where that came from. Uh, Proverbs 21, verse 15. The exercise of justice is joy for the righteous, but is terror for the workers of iniquity. What about giving? Proverbs eleven twenty five. Generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Are you a generous man? Are you a generous kind of person? Do you give what you've been given? Do you uh, do you see people in need and you want to help them? Are you a generous person, or do you say, hmm, better keep some of this to myself? Um, it says, a generous man. It says, a generous man will be prosperous. He waters will himself be watered. You need to be able to water someone else and watch them grow in order to be watered yourself. And then Proverbs 22, verse 16 says, He who oppresses the poor to make more for himself or gives back to the rich will only come to poverty. You know, you oppress the poor. That's not a good thing. Um, poor have God on their side. He who oppresses the poor to make more for himself to gain because he oppresses poor people who can't stand up for themselves or who gives to the rich. Why would he give to the rich? Because he thinks the rich would pay him back. He'll only come to poverty. He'll only come to poverty. And then understanding Proverbs 15, 16 to 17. Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and turmoil with it. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox served with hatred. This individual understands what is most important. What is most important? A little with the fear of the Lord. A dish of vegetables where love is. This individual understands what's important and what really has value. 
Proverbs 16, verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness and great income with injustice. You get a lot of money because you do it unjustly. Not a good thing. It's better to have a little that you get righteously. And then verse 19, it is better to be a humble in spirit with the lowly than divide the spoil with uh, the proud. So you can go with the proud and you can divide all the spoil and you can get all this stuff. Or you can be lowly and humble and um, not get a whole lot, but have a right character. Proverbs 22, verse 1 says, Good name is to be desired more than great wealth, favor is better than silver and gold. We in America, we pursue great wealth we pursue silver and gold because supposedly I think that's the American dream is to become rich I thought the American dream was to be free but you know now you're free to become rich a good name is to be more desired than great wealth you know, there's a lot of people that have a lot of money, but their name is worthless because, you know, they earned it through unjust means. Favor is better than silver and gold. It's better to have the grace of God on your life than all the silver and gold the world can offer. Proverbs 23, verses 4 and 5. Say, do not worry yourself to gain wealth. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. What does a wise man understand? Now, even if he has all the wealth he can obtain, it's all going to go away someday. I can guarantee you there's a day it's all going to go away. David's death, it's all gone. <laughs> He didn't take any of it with him. And he understands that. He understands that there's a wealth that this world provides and a wealth that God supplies. And he prefers the wealth that God supplies. Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. By wisdom a house is built. By understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all kinds of precious and pleasant riches. He knows what true riches are. He knows where... To look for true riches. Where does he find it? In wisdom and understanding. And then Proverbs 28, verse 6 says, Better is the poor who walks in an integrity than he who is crooked though he be rich. Again, there are many people who have riches of this world. They're crooked. They've uh, taken a advantage and they've oppressed the poor. But the one who has a good name is better than all that. But what's one thing in all these verses that's never encouraged? <laughs> Whether you're a good husband, a good man, a bad husband, bad man, good wife or bad wife, what's not encouraged? Exodus 20, verse 14. Divorce. Divorce is never encouraged. It's better to live in the corner of a roof than in a house with a contentious woman. But it doesn't say it'd be better to divorce the contentious woman than to live with her. It doesn't say um, an excellent wife is from the Lord, but contentious wife, you need to get rid of her. It doesn't say anything like that. Nowhere in the book of Proverbs do I ever read anything about divorce. Because if, if there were allowances for divorce in the book of Proverbs, um, Solomon would have to answer to God about the Ten Commandments, wouldn't he? Thou shalt not commit adultery. So what's the New Testament teaching? It was read for us this morning. 
Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 22, it says, First of all, I want to know how many of y'all are taking notes or not taking notes or going to get notes or whatever and are going to try to make sure that you abide by all of these things that Solomon wrote about a good wife and a good husband. You're really going to grit your teeth and do it. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, he says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also are wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. What's the New Testament teaching about wives? They are to be submissive as the church is to Christ. When is the church ever allowed not to be submissive to Christ? Never. So when is a wife allowed to be unsubmissive to her husband? Never. Uh, but then it gives a rule for the husband. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. So he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. That's how husbands are supposed to love their wives. I've heard people say that if a husband loved his wife this way, a wife would have no problem being submissive to her husband. I think she still would. Because it says in Genesis uh, that, hus that wives will want to rule their husbands. They just do. They want to do that. They don't want to be submissive. They want to rule. But husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church. Well, how did he love the church? He gave himself up for her. That's how you're supposed to love your wife. You're supposed to give your complete self up for her. Think about what did Jesus do for the church? He died. He died for the church so they might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. Jesus died on Calvary's cross because he loved the church. And he wanted to sanctify the church, and he wanted to set this church apart so that she would be holy and blameless. He died for the church. He loved the church. Now, did Jesus die for a submissive church? Wasn't submissive when he died. It's becoming more and more submissive, and it will become ultimately completely submissive. Jesus didn't wait for the church to be submissive to die for it, is what I'm trying to say. He died for the church because he loved the church. That's the story of Hosea. Hosea went and got a, um, a harlot to marry. And the harlot went away from him and did all kinds of evil. But what does it say Hosea did? What does it say the Lord will do? Like Hosea was supposed to be said, I will woo Israel back to myself. 
Jesus didn't die for a submissive church. He died for the church. Husbands, don't wait for your wives to be submissive. Love them as Christ loves the church. There's something that Peter said also, but I'm going to stay here for a second. So what's the, um, what's the crux of the issue? What's the crux of the issue for wives? What's the crux of the issue for husbands? It's Christ, isn't it? Wives are to be submissive to their husbands as the church is submissive to the Lord. It's that easy and that difficult. Husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. So now there aren't all these things about diligence and uh, anger and giving and understanding what's right and wrong. Why? Because if you are a loving husband... Will you be angry? No, you won't be angry if you're a loving husband. Will you be a diligent husband, providing for your family? Of course you will. You'll love your family. You'll want to provide for them. Will you be giving? Of course you'll be giving. You will understand that God has given you his own son. Will you be understanding of what's wise and what's wrong? Will you be content with vegetables where love is and a fatted feast where contention is? Sure you will. You'll understand those things if you know Christ and want to love your wife as Christ loved the church. And wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord or be submissive to your own husbands as to the Lord. What does that mean? That means your affection for your husband should be the exact same affection you have for Christ. Is that what you see in your husband? I venture to guess not. <laughs> yeah, you don't see Christ in your husband. I know that. I know my wife doesn't. But can you look beyond his faults and see him as God's representative on the earth, as Christ in your life, to lead you the way he's supposed to? Now imagine, imagine if just the church, if only the church did this, imagine if the church had husbands who loved their wives as Christ loved the church and wives who were submissive to their husbands as unto the Lord. What would that do? That would revolutionize this land. That would cause this people to stand up and take notice but we've become so much like the world. So much like the world. So Jesus, it's all right for a man to divorce his wife for any cause. Jesus said, have you not read that in the beginning he created the male and female? And what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Yeah, we thought you'd say that. But what about Moses? Why did Moses give us a commandment to divorce our wives? Jesus has to correct them again. He says, Moses never gave you a commandment to divorce your wife. He knew you were going to divorce your wife, so he provided a means, if you will, of doing it right. If you can divorce your wife correctly, which I don't know how you can, but if you could divorce your wife correctly, this is how it's done. You make sure all of her needs are met, you make sure all this is met, you make sure all this is met, and you take care of her. Moses understood you were going to be upset with your wives and divorce them. Therefore, he permitted it, never gave a commandment. What if the church had husbands who truly loved their wives as Christ loves the church and had wives who were submissive to their husbands as unto the Lord? I think that would be marvelous. 
I've always thought of my, my relationship with my wife as the relationship of Christ and the church, and we were going to have a testimony and all this. I've tried. I don't know if anybody notices, but I tried. Gave it my best shot. But, um, but that's why divorce has never, ever even been mentioned in our family. Because when we got married, it was for life or death, whichever came first. I don't love my wife as Christ loved the church. I want to. She's not submissive to me as she is unto the Lord, but she wants to be. We're working on it. We're moving in that direction, and one day we will. guess as I'm looking at this verse it says uh, they might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word reminds me of that song rock of ages rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure Save from wrath and make me pure. Sanctify me, O Lord, that I might be wholly yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this teaching in your book. Thank you for the teaching and the wisdom that Solomon has. But thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, for one who is greater than Solomon has come. And we worship him and give him the glory. Amen.